Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. Canada's Olympics began yesterday with a win that was as big of a loss as any win can be. The Canadian women's soccer team beat New Zealand. There was nothing surprising about that. Canada is way better. That's what's supposed to happen. It's everything that came before the match that was such a humiliating defeat. If you need a refresher or you want to get a sense of just how embarrassing this is, here is Team Canada making news on a national American network on the opening day of the Games. Let's talk about the big drama with a Canadian women's soccer coach and analyst being accused of using a drone to spy on practices. Talk to us about what we have learned about those allegations. Lana, the New Zealand women's team were practicing and they noticed a drone overhead. When they looked into it, it turned out it was being operated by an analyst um, employed by the Canadian delegation. Usually, when the eyes of the world are on you at the Olympics, you hope that a medal is involved and not investigations and even criminal charges. But here we are. Welcome to Paris. It's going to be fun. But what exactly did Canada do? And more importantly, why? What consequences will this have for those involved and for those who had nothing to do with it but will be tainted by scandal anyway? And if this is how we're starting the Olympics, what do we do for an encore? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Sid Sixero, a longtime sports commentator, currently the host of City TV's Breakfast Television, and uh, a Canadian soccer fan who is... Feeling what, Sid, now? Excited, disappointed, embarrassed? All shades of embarrassed. I don't know how many different ways. My, I forgot my thesaurus. <laughs> I don't know how many different ways I can say the term embarrassed differently. But it's, it's, I don't know what we're doing here, Jordan. Like, I, I don't, I don't understand how we keep stepping on a rake as a soccer nation when things look good for a moment, it's, it's as if someone in Canada soccer is like, we're having too much fun, time to bring everyone down. Time to, time to knock down everyone from this good time feeling that we're having and to throw in some complete silliness into the sauce. And we're here again. And, we're, and the thing is, everyone's watching this. This isn't your normal Canadian soccer they're kind of inept and they're in the Canadian news a little bit, but not the global news cycle, not the North American news cycle. You know, it's just we, we confined it to our space. This one we've decided to share with the global journalistic community who are in Paris starving for stories. It, and we <laughs> hand them this thing on a plate. It's like, right. it's like a buffet, this story. And, and everyone's running with it. Justifiably so. I'm seeing mainstream news outlets of every type in this country and beyond talking about this embarrassing situation for us where we droned our way into controversy. So explain exactly what happened here uh, that was so embarrassing and what everyone's talking about for the casual fan maybe who is looking forward to the Olympics and watching the Canadian soccer team uh, have a good time and now is like, wait, what just happened? What did we do exactly? Oh, we did, Jordan. We, <laughs> we, we did on this one. Okay, so uh, there's a video coach who isn't a fully accredited member of the Canada soccer team, but is around the team. And there was a practice recently where New Zealand were outdoors and there was a drone nearby, but they didn't think much of it. A few days later, at another practice, it happened again. And I don't know how they tracked it back to this video coach for Canada soccer, but they were successful in doing that. So they lodged a complaint with FIFA. Uh, they contacted Canada soccer. They contacted the Canadian Olympic Committee. And it really says a lot in a story, especially nowadays, Jordan, and I know you can attest to this, when people just admit right away to something. Right. So uh, the video coaching question 
was sent home from Paris. The assistant coach to Bev Priestman, who oversees this video coach, was also sent home. And Bev Priestman, in a preemptive move, in an effort to not be fully suspended from this tournament, decided not to be on the sideline for the first game on Thursday against New Zealand. What strikes me the most about the early moments of this story is how quickly Canada soccer said, yep, you got us. What proof New Zealand had, we don't know. We're not aware yet. We don't know how close this got to their facility. One of the other problems may have been French authorities have closed off a lot of airspace around these Olympics for obvious reasons. There is the feeling that this video coach for Canada was just dumb and didn't realize that airspace rules and laws in France are fairly serious. So not only has this video coach been sent home for Canada soccer, he was served an eight-month suspended sentence by French authorities. So he broke the law, too. Yep. Got a record, Jordan. Got a record. The Olympic dream. Go to the Olympics for three days, get a record, go home. That's what happened. Okay, you know soccer. Um, You've covered soccer a lot. What kind of advantage would we be gaining by spying on the New Zealand Olympic team ahead of yesterday's game? I asked someone who knows Canada soccer well that same question last night. Because I'm not aware of some flying V Mighty Ducks formation that you would learn. It's soccer. It's 11 on 11. You kind of know where people might be. Right. I I don't know... This isn't Dungeons and Dragons. Like, we can, we can figure this out to a certain extent. And on top of that, New Zealand are not some superpower in women's soccer. So I asked, as, as you're trying to use the least amount of profanity as possible, what is, what's Canada trying to learn here? And the answer I got was the things you would suspect. Are they trying some new strategies on set pieces, like corner kicks? How is the defense, like the back four, how are they moving the ball upfield? Is it long ball techniques? Is it, is it short passes? Are they playing possession football? So it was, it was what I suspected. But the one, thing, the one thing I learned last night that I wasn't aware of is this is happening way more with this country and other countries than we suspect, specifically with the drones. And it's gotten to the point where international teams, when they get together on the first day, or even some club teams in Europe, their first outdoor practice, they are so hypersensitive to the potential of a drone nearby, they don't run a real practice. They call it a dummy practice. So they're just kind of jogging, stretching, and a couple of free kicks, and everyone leaves. And they make it look good for the assembled media. Now, when the media aren't allowed in the practices later in the week, the third, fourth, and fifth, those are the real training sessions. Those are where you try out some stuff. And apparently, those were the sessions that Canada tried to infiltrate in Paris with New Zealand's women's team. So is this a case then of something that um, everyone is doing generally and uh, Canada's coach was just the only one dumb enough to do it when the airspace was closed, so it was the only thing in the sky? Correct. Like, I, I, I feel like this is happening way more than we think. I don't think may- many people try it, though, in the most restricted airspace in the world over a two-week period. There's an element of dumb to it that no one can deny, but it is happening. And I also asked someone last night, is this an isolated incident for Canada? And the answer I got back was FIFA, who are investigating this, because New Zealand filed an official complaint. FIFA, take this matter very seriously, is the answer I got back. And Canada has been fined previously. Interesting, because my next question for you was going to be, how far up does this go? Obviously, you get the people who are responsible for it and send them home, and that's fine. And uh, the head coach removes herself from at least one game. Do we have a sense of if Bev Priestman, the head coach, knew, if anybody above her knew, um, and especially if this is something that they've dealt with in the past? The feeling I got talking to some people was... This is, this is a multiple-time issue with Canadian soccer at a very high level. Very high level. Now, I, again... We don't know in terms for of sure. Bev, we don't know for sure. But I, I, I spoke to some people I trust last night. And I'm willing to at least reiterate what I was told. Someone also said to me, and it's true, if Bev Priestman, who claims to have no knowledge of this, 
if she if she actually had zero knowledge of this, she's incompetent and needs to go because she's not controlling her team and her staff. The other thing I was told though was the level of snickering that went on inside Canada soccer circles at her denial was quite something. Bev Priestman's in a really tough spot here because there's not a lot of people that I've talked to that buy this story. And again, uh, what the, what you're getting out of this to me is still minimal when you're talking about a team like New Zealand. The risks you are running are asinine to me. You can sell this to me if it's the United States, if it's England, if it's Sweden, if it's Japan, if it's a power. I could, there's a part of me that would, I still wouldn't do it, but there's a part of me that would understand it. To have this happen at, a, at an event of this profile is a serious issue for Bev Priest. And quite frankly, if this story continues to be unwrapped in this way, because now FIFA's investigating, the IOC's investigating, Canadian Olympic Committee's investigating, Canada Soccer internally is investigating, every stone is going to be turned over. I don't know how Bev Priestman keeps her position. I really don't. We're recording this right before the game kicks off. Uh, people listening will have heard uh, in the intro uh, a little bit from that game and and what happened. But I will ask you this going into it, knowing you can't see the future. We're the defending Olympic champions. Uh, New Zealand, I checked before we recorded, is ranked somewhere down in the 20s in the world. Like, we don't need to do this to beat New Zealand. Never mind, uh, never mind any of the other considerations about it. I would 100% agree with you. And again, when you're talking about women's soccer, if you're ranked in the 20s in the world, 16 get into the World Cup. You're not going to the World Cup normally. Right. Unless your qualifying region is generous to you. I'm with you. I don't understand what you could possibly glean from video that you captured in this way about a team that is not a power. And the scary part of the story for me is knowing how good a team Canada has and how strong of a side they have and how the young professionals on that team are now being pushed into a new leadership role with Christine Sinclair gone. This was a big moment. This was a huge moment for them. And now, all anyone's talking about is this story and did Canada legitimately win a gold medal three years ago in this competition? This is beyond unfair to these young women. Beyond who win things in Europe, win Champions Leagues in Europe. We have some of the best players in the world outside of Christine Sinclair. That's not the narrative today. I could only imagine what that mindset would be going into that game against New Zealand. I'll tell you, New Zealand, New Zealand probably felt a certain way about it. And I would hate if the story progressed, Jordan, to the point where we're now putting asterisks on a gold medal. That's, that's doomsday for this group. To hell with the coaching staff. I'm not that concerned. It's the players. The women's players in this country who at every turn have Lucy pull the football away from them. Whether it's financially, whether it's funding, whether it's Canada soccer, whether it's inept assistant coaches, whether it's a head coach who doesn't take accountability, they always have to clean it up. And I'm tired of watching that. They are an outstanding team. And they're only going to get better. And they have to deal with all this garbage around them constantly. And I don't get why. We just, we can't, we can't get out of our own way in this country. It's as, a, as someone who loves soccer, loves the game, it's disgusting to watch. It really is. I also wanted to talk to you a bit about the bigger picture of Canada at the Olympics in general when it comes to this scandal, because obviously Thursday was uh, the first real action of the games. As you mentioned off the top, uh, there was a whole press corps with nothing to talk about except this story. Canada introduced uh, its torchbearers, for instance, yesterday. And uh, unless you were really reading to the bottom of the roundups, you might not have known who they were. Um, what kind of impact does this have? Just never mind uh, the young women on the soccer team, but Canada's entire uh, Olympic group. I mean, that that is the part of this that I, I mean, just just to add to the, to the women's roster element of it, to have Maude Sharon... Uh, our weightlifting gold medalist and Andre de Grasse, our six-time medalist, have to do Zoom calls yesterday with the media with this 
hanging over them is, is Olympic malpractice for me. There's not a lot of Olympics, man. Like, you can't really screw that up. And we have. And I'm not criticizing the COC for their handling of this, because this is, in what world do you see this coming? I get it. But we do have some history in this country of break glass in case of Olympic emergency when it comes to stories. So there has to, there has to be some level of, of, of history we can draw upon in terms of how we handle this. And we just threw Mo Chiron and Andre de Grasse out there like it was nothing yesterday. Like it was nothing. And like, why not do it? If you, if you knew this story was coming, do that presser on Tuesday. Do that presser Monday. Let's think ahead. Let's give these young athletes some time and space to enjoy this as flag bearers in one of the most unique opening ceremony, it sounds like, in Olympic history, down the Sen River. I just, I, 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 I felt for them. I really did. The same way I feel for our women's uh, soccer roster. Well, you can imagine when the countries are walking down uh, the opening route and they're all being introduced and the commentators in other nations who are, you know, usually trying to talk about uh, whatever's interesting on a given country's roster or whatever hopes they might have. Like when Canada walks by, this is what they're going to talk about, right? This is the thing. Like, I don't know who's calling it for NBC, but there's a real chance Jimmy Fallon's ripping us on the Seine River. Yeah. Because of this story during NBC's cup. Like, like, you're right. This is the think about how many global broadcasts when we come up, because every country has their moment, what are they going to say? What are they going to say? It's, a, it's, it's ridiculous. And a little bit of interesting news about Canada, Bob, is that... Uh, you haven't yeah. heard, yes. <laughs> if, I mean, you know, never mind these amazing athletes. And I, I just, I, I, I hope this passes. I really do. And I, I, because if it continues, it's a feeding frenzy at these games, Jordan, that I, I hear when you're in that media village, it's... It's bees to honey globally. And you just can't, you can't, you can't squash a story over these two weeks. It is virtually impossible. That was what I was going to ask as we sort of wrap up here, which is, I hear that, but I put on my optimist hat for a moment. The Olympics always comes with amazing, unexpected moments. Uh, People come out of nowhere to do things you never hoped they could. And what are the chances? Obviously, yeah, this is what they're talking about during the opening ceremonies. Uh, certainly, they're going to be talking about it on the first day of the games on Thursday. What are the chances, though, that, you know, four or five days into the game, Simone Biles is doing incredible things. Uh, the U.S. men's basketball team and Canada's basketball team, for that matter, are uh, kicking ass. And, you know, maybe it doesn't stick around that much. Hopefully it doesn't. Unless it does. Because we're, we're in a situation where, like, Canada's in this. You have, you have a nation, New Zealand, that are screaming for some type of repercussion. This was multiple breaches, right? Like, it, wasn't, it just it wasn't the one drop. So my fear is that it'll be a drip, drip, drip on the story. Which, and you know how those go. And, and we can't steer clear of it. I hope you're right. I tend to lean negative. I hope you're right. And, and, and those young women can focus on defending a gold that they earned three years ago and not have this tainted further. I don't believe, based it was hand, on how it was handled, the story's leaving the headline. I don't. And it starts with Bev Priestman. Bev Priestman may have done herself a big disservice yesterday. And again, I, it made, listen, maybe it's bad PR. Maybe there's some legal ramifications around the story that we're not aware of. But I think her status in these games is going to be is going to remain a story Sid thank you as always it's a pleasure to talk to you and uh, (laughs) go Canada I guess enjoy the games Jordan Sid Sixero the host of Breakfast Television and obviously a disappointed soccer fan right now that was the big story for more from us Head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Shoot us a line. If you want to leave us some feedback, you can do that with an email to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca. Or you can call us and leave us a voicemail at 416-935-5935. Joe Fish is the lead producer of The Big Story. Robin Simon is also a producer. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. 
Mary Jubrin is our audience development lead. Sound design this week was provided by Christopher Clark. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. And I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. Thanks so much for listening. We've got a couple of surprises for you this weekend. And we'll be back with a fresh big story on Monday. We'll talk then.